All right, let me see if this is going to work much better for us this time. Um, so if you're on, just let me know um, if you're hearing this and um, if it is uh, <clears throat> loud and clear, if we are set and ready to go. So you are my, my sounding board. So you're gonna have to let me know how is it this time around before we can continue. All right, I see you, Craig Han. Uh, you want to just buzz me to let me know how is this uh, coming across now? Is it much better? Let me know if um, the sound situation is fixed. Um, the machine you were hearing is actually the laptop because um, the phone, the audio part actually rests on the laptop to actually hold it up while I use the laptop. So you're hearing it in the background. And the challenge with this phone is that this airpiece part is actually on the bottom part where it should sit. So it's kind of difficult for me to actually plug it in, but I'm trying it for the first time and it's working. I set it away where it actually um, uh, will be able to use and not impede. So that is wonderful. I'm happy to hear that. All right. So good night again, everyone. Nice to hear all of you. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Of course, you know, feel free to... Um, share these presentations with uh, friends and family or on your page if you think anyone uh, will be able to enjoy them if they'll um, like to watch them and be challenged by them learn something uh, with respect to these matters on um, why believers believe the way they do regarding the dead and what the scriptures teach about that I think for the past uh, what maybe two and a half to three weeks now we've been um, looking at this there are a couple of more to go. And so just bear with me as we take our time and we go through uh, what scripture reveals on um, the state of the dead. Uh, we had looked at the Old Testament uh, conceptualization of uh, the dead. We looked at the New Testament. And uh, we also had, um, last time when we looked at part three, we looked at um, hope in the face of death. Yes, we looked at that. So this evening we're going to be looking at the intermediate state. The intermediate state. That's what we're going to be looking at this evening. And of course, um, this will encompass both the righteous and the wicked. What scripture reveals about them. Uh, what happens after we die. That's essentially what the intermediate state is. Um, you're not going to find the word itself, intermediate state, in the Bible. Um, but it is a, a word that was coined or a phrase that was coined to actually um, encapsulate the time between uh, heaven and final judgment for, for um, unbelievers, heaven for believers, and of course now. So this current life in between and then final destinations essentially, uh, that's what um, intermediate state uh, essentially is. Uh, St. Clair Ferguson and J.R. Parker uh, said this about the intermediate state. The expression is not found in the Bible, but traditionally it refers to the condition of mankind between death and resurrection. For unbelievers, it is, state, it is a state of anguish and torment in Hades. Luke chapter 16, verses 23 to 25, uh, and verse 28, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, as they await resurrection and final judgment. John 5, verses 28 to 29. They continue, Since divine judgment is based on, the, on an evaluation solely of one's life on earth, the intermediate state affords no second chance to repent and embrace the gospel. So there's no repentance uh, and embracing the gospel in the intermediate state. For the believer, it is a period during which his bodily, bodiless soul in conscious communion with Christ awaits the receipt of the resurrection body. Again, these might be triggering for some people, uh, especially if their worldview different, if they understand death to be a state of non-existence or annihilation when we die. But again, bear with me and check out the facts for yourself. Alternatively, if believers receive their spiritual bodies at death, there is no hiatus of disembodiment between death and the second advent. And the intermediate state denotes more generally the interval between death and the consummation of all things. 
In either case, the state is both temporary and imperfect. Revelation 6, 9 to 11, and we look at some of these texts uh, soon. The focus of the New Testament is not on the penultimate interim state of the believer, but on his final destiny, viz. the resurrection state of immortality. Although departed believers are no longer active in or conscious of the temporary earthly world of time and space, Isaiah 63 verse 16, they are fully alert to their new environment, for they are not only resting from their labors in joyful satisfaction and safe in God's hands, but they are literally in the presence of Christ. They live for God's glory and they live spiritually as God does. This is essentially um, how J.I. Parker and Sinclair Ferguson uh, define the intermediate state. They referred to a couple of texts of scriptures and of course we had seen some of them before and we will look at some of them uh, this evening as well. So that's what we're looking at this evening. We're looking at the intermediate state. Uh, there are various scriptural passages, especially in the New Testament, that speak clearly of the fact that a believer's spirit does not die, but goes to be with Christ in heaven at death. And so there are various scriptural passages where the New Testament reveals that when a believer dies, their spirits or soul goes to be with Christ at death in heaven. In John 11, uh, 25 to 27, let me turn there quickly. Jesus had this conversation with the sister of Lazarus, and he made some profound uh, statements. In verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So for, for Martha, and of course being a Jew, a lot of these things weren't revealed to them from the Old Testament motif theology. Um, even up to this point, a lot of things weren't clear. Remember that it is Christ who brought the full counsel of God and the full truth and knowledge of God and life and the hereafter to all peoples. And so Christ, as John 1.18 calls him the exegete of God, he is the one who, who has the final word, who makes the most authoritative statements on theology, uh, matters of life, death, eschatology, etc. So for Martha up to this time, she's still expecting that it's only at the last day that um, people will experience a, a resurrection, a coming back to life. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And so he was, he is, he stands as that which he anticipated, the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. So here he says, because he's the resurrection and the life, the one who believes in him, even though they experience death, they will live. They will continue to live. And in verse 26, he says profoundly, whoever lives in this physical life and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Then she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God who should come into the world. So Jesus makes a profound statement here with respect to uh, the nature of man, with respect to death and with respect to life. He says, the one who believes in him and dies will experience life, and the one who currently lives and believes in him will never die. That is, they will never uh, experience physical, any sort of physical separation from God. There's never going to be a time when believers are disconnected from God, they're separated from God, they no longer live um, as God lives. There's not going to be any gap between uh, themselves and God and that continuous conscious existence. This is what he's saying here. And the last time we spoke, I told you the, very, the, the strength of the Greek there. Uh, uh, will never die is a, is, a, is a double negative in the Greek. Ume. Uh, and that's how it's translated in the, the English. Will never. It's simply, it, it is two uh, negatives. Will not not die. It's an absolute negation. It's a statement of fact that is expressing an absolute negation. So there's never a time uh, in a believer's life when they will be separated from God. The bodies experience death and they go back to the ground, they deteriorate and, and stuff. 
But there's a part of us that survives the death of the body, that lives on. And this is why Jesus can say, believers never die. In Mark chapter 12, verses 26 to 27, and let me turn there quickly to read it for you. Uh, Jesus again makes another profound statement regarding the state of believers, the intermediate state. Mark chapter 12, verses 26 to 27, uh, Jesus says, well, and of course, this was um, concerning um, the dead, resurrection, and the life. Uh, let me read from verse 24. When the, the, the Sadducees, who didn't believe that there was uh, any resurrection to come, um, tried to trap him about a man who had seven. Uh, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife. He died. He left no offspring until, you know, the liverite law kicked in and all of them had to marry her. And last of all, the woman died. They had no children. Then they said to him, uh, therefore in the resurrection, uh, when they rise, whose wife would she be? Because seven of them had her. So where they are concerned, there was no resurrection. That's what the Sadducees believed. And they sought to trap Jesus with this intricate uh, situation. But notice how Jesus responds. He said to them, are you, therefore, uh, mistake, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? So these were the religious leaders I mean, these people had centuries of studies under their belt and tradition and you name it, expositions. And Jesus still said to them, you are hugely in error because you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God on this matter. Then he says, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are like the angels. So they're neither married nor given a marriage. They're just like the angels, basically. Uh, verse 26, he says, but concerning the dead that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Therefore, you are greatly mistaken. So what Jesus is actually saying here is he's affirming that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were alive. Despite the fact that they would have been physically dead for Hundreds of years. This is, this is what he's saying. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And we're going to see in another passage where he says, all live in him. So believers never die in God. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus affirmed that many will come from the east and west and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. He speaks here uh, as if it is now that they are currently in God's kingdom. And we're going to see that they indeed are. And he says, he, 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 he speaks of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob like they are currently in God's kingdom of heaven. And there are many who are going to come from the various remote corners of the earth. And they will be uh, uh, sit down with Abraham, Isaac, living in God's kingdom currently. And so this text affirms ostensibly that believers do not die. We do not cease to exist when we experience a departure from this life, essentially. There's never a point when believers cease to exist. Luke's account of the crucifixion of Jesus also, uh, of the two thieves, reveal a potent point about the intermediate state of believers. And excuse me quickly, let me just pull up my Greek uh, text for this. And Luke chapter 23, verse 42. Luke chapter 23, verse 42. And this is when Jesus was um, being crucified. And one of the thieves uh, was uh, remorseful. And um, while the other one was jeering. And he said to Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And in verse 43, Jesus affirmed, truly, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, a lot of people have developed their entire system of psycho panachism, soul sleep. We're going to deal with that more in depth in another section uh, saying, well, what Jesus is saying here, he's affirming this very day. Uh, he's making a promise to the thief that he'll be with him sometime much later in, in paradise. And and they, they, they make a big argument over the comma on where it's placed in the King James Version. But um, I'm going to actually read the Greek for you, beloved. And I can um, tell you straight up, where the Greek is concerned, 
there is no comma in the Greek. Okay, the Greek has no comma, so this argument about the comma is extremely moot. It, it is an English imposition. But where the Greek text is concerned, it is the tenses of the words, uh, the, 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 the syntax and the grammar, and the truth that is being expressed that matters. Not comma, because there's no comma in the Greek. So Luke 23, verse 40, 23, yes, verse 43, Jesus says, uh, verse 23 says, Kai apen auto, and he said to him, Amen soy lego, simeron met imu ese ento paradiso. So he said to him right then and there, Amen, which is a statement of fact. It is something truthful. Uh, you could take it to the bank and cash it. That is what Amen in Hebrew and Greek actually uh, is expressing. This is something that is absolutely truthful. Amen. Soy Lego. To you, I am currently saying. Lego here is the present active indicative first person singular in the Greek. Right? It's a statement of fact being presently made to this thief here. Semeron. Semeron. The Greek word here is Semeron. It means this very day. Semeron actually refers to a specific time. Uh, uh, um, when something will definitely happen. Today, today, today. This is what it, what is it I'm, I'm expressing here. This very day, met imu, met imu again. Another wonderful preposition with um, personal pronoun here. Met, as I said to you before, there are three pre prepositions that express closeness and intimacy in the Greek. There is para, which means beside. There is meta, which means also with, beside, and there's soon. Soon, as I had e explained, and we will look at it again in Philippians 1 and uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, expresses a much more intimate and closer uh, relationship than para and meta. But all of them express close proximity, uh, relationship, etc. Et it's just a matter of degrees. Para, meta, soon. And here, met imu, this is personal closeness with me jesus is saying here they say you will be again <laughs> very very profound uh, a, a statement here you will be with me in paradise and so there is no mistaking with respect to what jesus is saying uh, to the thief here now the question is did jesus go to paradise on the same day absolutely when you actually do some uh, uh, more reading and we look at first peter uh, sometime as uh, as well when you actually do some reading with respect to death and the afterlife uh hades paradisio paradise uh, you'll get to understand that before uh the crucifixion and resurrection of jesus everyone went to hades the conceptualization of hades the abode of the dead was that uh it was divided into two compartments there is uh uh uh, the Gehenna part, where there is torment, the rich man and Lazarus encapsulates this very well, where the, the, the bodily soul of the wicked experience temporary punishment and torment until the resurrection. And then the other part, the other section, was where the souls of the righteous went. That was called a paradise as well as Abraham's bosom. This is how uh, it was conceptualized before the resurrection of Christ. Now, after the resurrection, we pick up in Ephesians chapter 4, when it says, Christ now, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Those who were Satan's captives, he led as his captive, which means he emptied Hades of the souls of the righteous and took them with him in heaven. You're going to see how this is put together beautifully. Uh, so, so he went in paradise. And we'll see that Peter talks about at his death. In 1 Peter 3, he went and he preached to the spirits in prison. His spirit, Jesus' spirit at death went and preached to the spirits of the disobedient and to the Luvians. And at his resurrection, he took the souls of the righteous that were in Abraham's bosom, that were in paradisio, paradise, and he took them with him to heaven. To the point that by the time we, 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 we jump into Revelation, we see where paradise is now a part of heaven, the abode of God. And so where the Greek is concerned here, beloved, there's no mistaking 
what Jesus is saying. Truly, I am currently saying to you right now, you are going to be with me uh, in paradise. And so this whole argument about the comma, there is no comma in the Greek manuscripts, beloved friends. There is no comma in the Greek. Okay, so you're not going to build a theology around a, 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 a quasi uh, KJV 1611 comma etc. You're not going to build a strong case and argument for that when it's the Greek text itself that actually is saying it, saying it uh, profoundly what it needs to say. And let me just read it to you again. Kai apen auto. And he said to him right then and there, Amen. Statement of fact. Uh, you could take it to the bank and cash it. So I lego to you. I am saying, Semiron, this very day. You will be with me in paradise. Now, you want to compare Sir Miron? Read Hebrews chapter 4, where it speaks about salvation. If you hear his voice today, hard not your heart. It's the same Greek word that is used, Semiron, which means this very day as you hear God's voice, you, you should not harden your heart. You should respond to the gospel. You'll be saved. That refers to the moment, the instant you hear the gospel. This is what Jesus is saying to him. This very day, you're going to be with me in paradise. And when the thief indeed did die that day, and Jesus did die, the thief was with Jesus in paradiso, in paradise. And when he ascended, he took the souls of the righteous. He led those who were Satan's captives as his captive to heaven. When you read Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, the 24 elders who are sitting before the throne, and they, they sing to God. They have on uh, the crowns. Now, what's interesting about crowns, uh, the, the, these crowns that they're wearing, and this is off topic, but it's actually in topic. Uh, so, uh, what's interesting about the crowns that they are wearing, uh, the victor's crown there that they are actually wearing, beloved friend, is Stephanos. It's a crown of victory. After you would have run uh, in the Roman games or uh, gladiator games, etc., and you conquer, you receive a Stephanos. No angel is ever presented in scripture as wearing a Stephanos. Stephanos are only given to conquerors. And so Jesus, who was man, conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave. He's presented in Revelation 14 as wearing a Stephanos. And God's people, all of us who are, are said to be, will receive a crown of life you see throughout the New Testament. It's a Stephanos. There are two words for crown. There's the diadema, which is the royal crown passed on by royal blood. We see this in Revelation 13, as well as Revelation 19. The beast from the bottomless pit, the crowns on his head, uh, royalty. Jesus also has on a royal crown in Revelation 19 because he is royalty. He's the son of the father. So he both wears a diadema as well as a Stephanos. Angels don't wear Stephanos. Angels did not conquer anything. They're not presented ever in scripture as being victors. But the 24 elders who are before the throne of God in John's vision in Revelation chapters 4 and chapter 5, they have on a Stephanos, a crown of victory that they throw before the feet of God and the Lamb and they sing a song saying, He's worthy to receive honor, glory, power, and might, etc. And then it talks about how He has redeemed them from the earth. So where were they redeemed from the earth? And they are now the first fruits to God. So this can be tied in very well with Ephesians 4, with some of the souls of the righteous, uh, the 24 elders were among, who were taken out of Paradiso, out of that section of Hades, out of Abraham's bosom, and they are taken to be Christ's captives in heaven. Before you think I'm talking foolishness, just bear with me. I have a whole lot more to share with you. I'm just taking time to, to, to break scripture down. So Simeon here, this very day, same thing used in Hebrews chapter 4. This very day when you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, you enter into God's grace. Today, today, today. Simeon, I am saying to you, you will be with me in paradise. So here Jesus was assuring the thief of his salvation as well as his soul going to a better place when he dies in spite of the cruelness of the crucifixion that he was facing. This is what is happening here, beloved friends. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, kindly do your research. And again, I'm open for any discussion on, on, on the Greek text here that I just read to you. For those of you who, who, who will differ and say, well, that's not what the tense or what it is saying. And, and there, there were comments in the Greek. Please provide the evidences. As you know, I'm not a stubborn individual. I ain't going to ask the grind. I'll, I'm, I'm willing to change positions anytime I see a better, stronger view or argument. 
Uh, so cough it up and I'll quickly do so. But where the Greek text is concerned, Jesus was assuring him, this very day, you are going to be with me in paradise. And First Peter chapter 3, Jesus did went to paradise. He preached to the disobedient spirits in prison, proclaimed his victory. And when he resurrected, he took the souls of the saints who were there with him to heaven. And of course, Matthew 27, some of them were resurrected to also uh, be presented to the people in Jerusalem to proclaim Christ's victory as well. Matthew 27 talks about. So there's a lot of things going on here, beloved, which speaks strongly to the fact that uh, believers do not cease to exist when they die. Uh, here's, another, here's, another, um, here's another powerful text. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, verses 1 to 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 4, and let me turn there quickly so I can read it for you. And this here now is extremely, extremely uh, important and very revealing. Paul says, It is doubtless uh, not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of, bo of, out of the body, I don't know. God knows such one was caught up in the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. Uh, Paul here is speaking very humbly of himself in the third person. When you actually look at uh, what he's justifying here. There were those who were claiming to be super apostles and boasting and all of that kinds of stuff. And Paul says, hey, I, I, I'm not going to boast about these fleshly things. But if I do boast, let me share some of the things that I've experienced with, experience with you. He says, 14 years ago, he knew a man in Christ. He's referring to himself. And notice here how Paul is expressing the fact that uh, there is a part of us that is disconnected from the body. There is the body, and then we have a soul in the body. He says whether in the body, physically, he's not sure, or whether it is out of the body, he's not sure how he know this man. He's not sure if it was some a transcendental experience or whatever, or if it was a literal thing, but all he know is this thing happened. And then he says, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. He's talking about himself, how he was transported to heaven itself where God is. But he's not sure if it's his entire body went there or if it's just his spirit that went there. That's what he means by whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell. He's not sure if it was an out of the body experience he had or if it was full bodied. He says, I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, only God knows. Only God knows what, what, what he experienced. He says how he was caught up to paradise. So paradise here, Paul is using it interchangeably with the third heaven. And he heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. In other words, he heard the, the, the heavenly language that, that is not even lawful for him to, to, to speak it. This is what he's saying here. So, so Paul had an out-of-body experience where he was taken to paradise, heaven, where God dwells right now. Before paradise was a section of Hades, but at the resurrection of Christ, he took paradise there with him. He took the saints with him, and that is where they are. And you are going to see this for yourselves, brothers and sisters. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, uh, it says that the tree of life is in the midst of the paradise of God, and believers will eat from it. So paradise is currently where God is now, where the saints are. So when Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, it was first in that section of Hades, and then when he resurrected, he took paradise with him to heaven. So heaven is now conceptualized as paradise. So where is Jesus today? He's in heaven. Where is the thief on the cross? Jesus says this very day. You're going to be with me right there. He's in heaven. His body is still here, but his spirit is in heaven. Again, beloved friends, this is how scripture, uh, what scripture reveals about the intermediate state uh, for believers. Our spirits 
go to be with God. Solomon had hinted on it in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 7. Then will the dust return to the ground and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So when we die the death, the, the, when we uh, die rather, uh, uh, um, the body, the matter, it remains there. It goes to the ground, it dilapidates, it, it uh, uh, depletes, you name it, until it disintegrates back into dust. But the spirit, there's a part of us that continues to live, beloved friends, and it goes to God who had given it. So when Jesus said to the uh, thief on the cross, today you're going to be uh, with me in paradise, he knew exactly what he was saying to him. Remember, Jesus has information beyond our scope of understanding. He's the one who created heaven and earth, the unseen realm. He's the one who has the final word uh, on, on the state of believers, what happens at death, etc. And he said to the thief, you're going to be with me today in paradise. And that's exactly what happened. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, we also see another beautiful, comforting passage. Uh, Paul says, we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hand eternal in the heavens. So Paul says, God has prepared a new body for us. And he conceptualizes it as a tent. Again, notice the strong metaphors to describe the state of man. There's the tent. And when you go in it, you live in the tent. So the real you, the spirit, is that which lives in the tent. This is uh, what Paul is saying here. So if this tent is destroyed, there's a new one that God is preparing for believers. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation from heaven. Notice how he says it. We, the real us, our spirit man, wants to be clothed with this new tent. So, so the body is a tent that the spirit inhabits. This is essentially what he's saying here. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Again, it is not the will of God that our spirits be naked. Not at all. And this makes a lot of sense as to why the souls of the saints in Revelation 6 were given white robes to clothe them. To and they were told to rest a little while before their bodies are resurrected and they anticipate and wait for uh, the martyrdom of the uh, fellow believers as themselves. Then he says, for we who are in this tent, we groan, being buried, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. So, so we're groaning and burdening. We want a better body. This is what he's saying. And, and the body here, he can't be referring to, 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 to himself, the real him and the body as the one and the same thing here. It doesn't make any sense. Because the fact of the matter is, you can't cut him up and say, oh, there Paul dwells. He dwells in this blood vessel. He's in this section of the brain. I mean, when you even look at this thing philosophically, uh, you will realize that we do have a spirit. There's a part of us. Uh, that lives on. We are much more than matter. We are much more than this dirt, uh, blood and marrow and bones and that sort of stuff. We are much more. Our brains is, is, is much more than gray matter. Our mind is an, uh, is an intangible, in, intangible spiritual entity, beloved friends. Our spirit is an intangible spiritual entity. So Paul says we want to be better clothed that mortality, this mortal body, may be swallowed up by life. Eternal life is what he means here. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God himself. So God has done it, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So God gives us the Holy Spirit that he is going to fix up this wretched body. Uh, I see Sister Sherry's Graham saying this body has holes. You're absolutely right. This tent is, is, is full of holes. It's messed right up. And so we do need a better one. This is what Paul is saying here. He says, so we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body. Notice he's speaking with respect to his spirit and his body. The, the, the body is the house and the spirit is that which dwells in the house. And he says, while we are resident in this tent, in this house, we are away from the Lord. We're not in his presence. We are absent from the Lord. 
He says we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, and uh, 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 yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body but to be present with the Lord. So he's saying here, I prefer that I am absent from this body in this physical earthly realm and be present with the Lord. Again, where is the Lord, brothers and sisters? The Lord is in heaven. And that's where Paul says he wants to be present. What part of him will be present there? Of course, it's his soul. It is his spirit. And then he says, therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, we are well-pleasing to him. So we endeavor, whether in this life or the next, we're pleasing to him. He's pleased with us. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone will receive uh, the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or whether bad. So again, how we treat the body, how this soul treats the body and directs this body, a reward will come. This is what he's communicating here. So here again, currently we are absent from the Lord. We're physically absent from him. He is currently in heaven. And, and as we are in this tent, present here, we are away from him. We are absent. And so there is no mistake in beloved friends with respect to how believers are presented, their souls. Philippians chapter 1 is another passage that's, that is strong and explicit in teaching what happens to believers at death. Again, we had, we had looked at it uh, last time. And of course, it's worth looking at it again. Paul says it from verses 20 to 25, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed at all, but that with full cover courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So he is saying he wants Christ to be honored in his body, whether it's through life or through death, whichever one happens to him to continue to live. He wants Christ to be honored or to, to experience death. He wants Christ to be honored. Then he continues, for to me to live is Christ. Living is living for Christ. To die is gain. And gain here, the Greek word kurdos, that is used, it literally refers to a prophet. Like when James chapter 2 talks about, uh, 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 about faith and works, and you say, well, we'll go into such and such a city, uh, sell and get gain. Kurdos is making a large profit. And so Paul says, if I'm living, it is for the Lord. But if I die, it is gain. It's a profit. Now, again, think it through, beloved friends. If Paul is going to cease to exist at death, if he's annihilated, he, he's no longer, the Paul he was is no longer, he, there, there's no activities going on. There's no part of him that continues to live thereafter. How is that gain with respect to life? He says, if he's living, he'll do so for Christ. But if he's die, it's great gain. It's kurdos. It's something he's earning. Some profit he's turning over, basically, that is much better than living here and now. So if Paul is going to cease to exist, there's, there's nothing that is conscious about him. Uh, he, he just reduced the food for worms and dust and ashes. There's nothing to be enjoyed by death. How is that any sort of gain? How can he ever call it gain, brothers and sisters? It just doesn't make any sense. Paul had to know there is something much greater than this life that he's going to immediately enjoy as to why he could say, if I die, it is great gain. It's a profit for me. Then he says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. So if I live in the flesh, it's fruitful labor in the ministry. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. I'm having a hard, I have, it's a hard decision to make. Should I remain in the flesh now and, and labor in the Lord and get fruitful labor? Or should I die and get great again? This is what Paul is having a hard struggle here with. And then he continues to express himself here. This dilemma he's facing. And at the same time re revealing solid theology with respect to the intermediate state. He says, my desire is to depart and depart here, analusai, the aorist uh, tense he uses there, instantaneous, uh, aorist infinitive, to instantaneously depart, that is, uh, leave this life is to be and to be with Christ. Paul says he has a strong desire to die. 
so that he could be with Christ. I already broke down the Greek for you last time. So in Christo there. It's much more intimate than para and met emu as we saw in Luke 23. Paul says he has a great desire. This is the gain. He talks about if he dies, he's going to get great gain. He says, if I die, I'm going to get great gain. What is this great gain? He says, my desire is to die. Analusai. Analuo. From the Greek word, uh, from the root rather, analuo. Uh, to depart, to leave this life and to be where? With Christ. With Christ here, soon Christo is the immediate personal intimate presence of Christ. It's much more intimate than met Emu in Luke 23, 43. And, and, and para in various other places of the New Testament. Soon Christo is a close personal face-to-face -face basking in your presence and glory uh, 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 relationship. It's like a husband and wife hugging up and, and, and kissing up and holding hands or or two friends are sitting over a dinner table and having dinner and enjoying lunch together, basking in laughter and recollection and fun, enjoying merriment. This is what soon is encapsulating here, beloved friends. And again, if you disagree, you are free too. If you think I'm just making nonsense of the Greek construction here, you know, please provide your exegetical work. And let me examine it so I can possibly change my position. But this is what the author Paul is expressing. He's going to get great gain by dying because when that happens, he's going to be with in the immediate, personal, intimate presence of Christ. This is the gain he, he's going to get. And so he's weighing the options. If I stay in this flesh, uh, I got some missionary journeys to deal with. I got some churches to build up. I got the gospel to preach. I got a lot of people to save. So that is wonderful. This is what Paul is saying. But at the same time, if I die right now, I'm going to be in the immediate personal presence of Christ. Paul says, OMG, this is a hard dilemma. I'm pressed between the two uh, options here. Which one to choose? I, I, I'm confused. I don't know which one to choose. I want to stay and preach and build the churches. But at the same time, the joy of being in the immediate personal presence of Christ, it far outweighs. So, so, so what do I do? Paul explains. He said, and he says, that is far better. Dying to be with Christ is, is far better than being here on this earth to be preaching, teaching, converting Gentiles and building churches. So again, if he's going to the ground, if he's going to cease to exist, and there's no part of him that continues after death, how is dying to be with Christ far better? When he loses all consciousness, he ceases to exist. How is that far better than actually being here, building churches and bringing people to faith? It's absurd, beloved friends, if we, if, if we, if we interpret this to be saying, well, Paul is ceasing to exist here. It doesn't make an ounce of sense. Because if he's going to cease to exist, he's annihilated, then of course living is the best option. But he's saying here, man, these two options are so glorious that I don't know which one to choose. I can stay here and keep building you up and keep building the churches and keep preaching the gospel of the kingdom, or I can die and be in the immediate personal presence of Christ, which is gain, which is far better. And so we actually understand and see what is happening here. We can see why Paul had such a tough decision with respect to these two here. Then he says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So here, Paul, when he weighs it out, well, if I go in the presence of Christ, I'm there, I'm all happy, everything is crisp, but you will miss my work, my gifting and calling and my strength in the church. So I'm going to remain here a little longer for you. This is better for you. Notice what he says. It's better for you that I remain. Then he says, convinced of this, convinced to remain for now. I know that I will remain and continue with you all. Why? For your progress and joy in the faith. So Paul says, I have a hard decision to make. I can choose anyone at any moment. But you know what? For your sake, I'll stay. Because when I go, I'm going to get great gain. Be in the immediate, personal, intimate presence of Christ. It's far better for me. It's gain for me. That's what I want. But if I go, I'll be locked away from this earthly realm. I can't do what I used to do here. 
So I'll stay so that you can make progress in the faith, so that you can continue to experience joy in the faith here and now. This is profound, beloved friends. When believers die, our death is gain. On our regular uh, Oasis uh, Ministries conference Zoom study earlier this week, uh, John quoted Psalm 16, which spoke about precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And indeed, the death of saints is precious because not only are they leaving a testimony here for believers and unbelievers alike, but they also get to be in the immediate personal presence of their maker and savior. So death for the believer is great gain. This is what Paul is saying here. We are benefited by death because we will get the chance to be ushered in the, into the immediate personal intimate presence of Jesus Christ. So this passage not only functions as a teaching point on this issue, but it also provides comfort for believers in the face of death. It provides as much comfort. When we die, we literally go to a better place. I know it's, it's cliched and we hear it a lot, but that is a fact. That is reality. This is what Paul said. So instead of, being, instead of death being dreaded, believers can face it with confidence, knowing that their spirits will be instantaneously ushered into the personal presence of Christ in heaven. In Hebrews chapter 12, let me go there. This is another one. I told you I'm not talking foolishness when I talk about uh, the, the, the spirits of the, of the righteous beloved friends. Let me go to Hebrews chapter 12. And how they are now in heaven. They were taken from Hades, from Abraham's bosom. And then now with God, with Christ and the angels in heaven. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 tells us that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And we are to lay off the, the weight and the sin that easily besets us. Now... Paul says this, and excuse my much sweating, beloved friends. As you know, Jamaica is very hot and humid. Uh, and the fan ain't, ain't, ain't doing much of a good job tonight. So forgive my constant wiping my face and sweating. And you know, the teaching is very exciting. So <laughs> that's another issue. Uh, so, so Paul makes this statement. Well, rather the author. I believe it's Paul, but, you know, for argument's sake, the author says, we are surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who are these great cloud of witnesses he talks about? He's talking about the heroes of faith in the previous chapter, Hebrews 11, who have not yet experienced a resurrection, who uh, without the saints remaining will not be perfected, completed. So he says, we are surrounded by, by them as a great cloud of witnesses. And this here is presented like, like, like you know, the, the, the football arena. Uh, the gladiatorial arena, the, the, the various uh, places of entertainment where the, the, the competition is going on in the field and then surround, we're surrounded in the arena, you know, the spectators and people watching the game. This is how it's, it's being presented here. So Paul, or the author rather, <laughs> for argument's sake, is, is saying that Believers currently are surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses. Where are these witnesses? He's going to explain who these witnesses are. So they are there as an encouragement, right? This great of cloud of witnesses are the saints of, uh, spoken of in chapter 11, who though they are dead, their spirits are in heaven right now, and they surround us as a means of encouragement for us to run the gospel race and to be faithful. So he's drawing them. As a bone of motivation for us to continue to keep running. It's like they're cheering us on. They have been in this life. They have struggled with the flesh. They have experienced persecution and done great exploits for the Lord. We're surrounded by them. They are cheering us on. As we run this gospel race. And then in verses 24, 22 to 24, he's going to identify who these are, beloved friends. Let me read it for you. Very slowly. From verse 18 now to verse 24, he's going to contrast the two covenants and the witnesses. From verse 18 to 21, he spoke about the witnesses and the individuals involved in the first covenant. How there was uh, uh, the Mount Zion that they couldn't touch. It was darkness and tempest, the sound of a trumpet. The people were quaking. Even Moses said he was terrified at what he saw. He says, it's not that covenant and company you are among. 
Notice the contrasting company. He says, believers are among here. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. He says, this is what we have approached. Uh, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are, are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect. The author is saying here, those heroes of faith he described in chapter 11, we have approached them. They are currently in heaven. He describes who are in heaven. He, he, he describes God, the angels, the, the assembly who are registered in heaven, Jesus Christ, great innumerable company of angels. And then he says, the spirits of righteous people who have been made perfect. Beloved friends, I don't know how much clearer it can get. They are currently in heaven right now and they are that great of cloud of witnesses who are cheering us on to encourage us as we run this gospel race. The spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect. You can't get it more clear than that. So as we survey scripture, as we survey the New Testament, beloved friends, we are seeing a consistent testimony and witness about the intermediate state, about uh, believers and what we look forward to. And so it couldn't be more clear. Revelation chapter 6 is very, very similar too. As I bring this study to a close, brothers and sisters. We went, we dealt with this properly uh, last week. So let me just reiterate it. Revelation chapter 6. It testifies in apocalyptic language how the souls of the saints who were killed are crying under the altar. They're seen as a sacrifice there. And they're crying out to God for justice. And white robes were given to them and they were instructed to rest a little longer until their fellow saints will suffer the same fate. Revelation chapter 6 verses 9 to 11. And so what these scripture passages are teaching clearly beloved is that the spirits of believers go to be with Christ in heaven at death while the body sleeps until the resurrection. And I will read one last scriptural passage as we close for the, this evening uh, because my time has come. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4 speaks in similar language with respect to the spirits of the righteous and where they are. Uh, Paul says in, from verse 13, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. And so the body of believers in the ground are considered to be asleep, lest you sorrow as do others who have no hope. So again, as I told you before, the pagans who didn't have hope of an afterlife, of when one of their family member or close friend died, they sorrow hopelessly. Some of them went into deep depression, killed themselves, all sorts of stuff. They cursed the gods. I mean, the list goes on. But Paul says believers have hope in their death and so, and so they should not sorrow like the unsaved do. Then he says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So, 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 so God is going to bring with him again soon auto. This is the same intimate preposition of Philippians chapter 1 verse 23. God is going to bring with him. When Jesus is, is coming the second time, where is he coming from? He's coming from heaven. And the saints are with him and they're coming down. And he's going to resurrect. Uh, he's going to resurrect their bodies. And they'll be reunited. Their, their bodies are glorified and reunited with their spirits. And forever they are like that. This is what is being communicated here. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So those who are currently dead, 
uh, will experience a resurrection and a translation with the same, same time with those who will be alive. For the Lord himself will descend with a shout. Notice he's descending and he's bringing with him those who would have died. So obviously it's their spirits he's bringing because their bodies are in the ground awaiting his shout of resurrection. He will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. Notice, same thing again. Soon or twice, with them. In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So in our perfect glorified bodies reunited with our spirits, we will always be with the Lord. Beloved friends, it can't get more clear than that. And if I may, I know I said I had just one last passage, but some impressed me to just go through this one briefly uh, in First Peter to show you that people aren't annihilated at death. They don't cease to exist. There's a part of us that lives on. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. His body was dead, but his spirit was continually alive. His spirit didn't die. You know, if Christ did cease to exist at death, that has so much implication for deity, for divinity. Was he truly divine? Can God cease to exist can god die but christ his superstatic union when he became you know took on flesh his his spirit divinity joined with the body he was one man but when he experienced death on the cross the body died but his spirit continued to live and this is exactly what the passage is going to say he and, and so he was made alive in the spirit by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. So here at his death, Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine uh, suffer, long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing. That is, eight souls were saved through fire. So at his death, he went to Hades. And that is why when he came back up in Revelation, John picks up the story. Jesus says, hey, I am the one who was dead. Now I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of Hades and death. So he's the boss and controller now. He determines who goes in and who, who comes out. This is what he's communicating. And so beloved friends, beloved friends, the, the, these are more than clear with respect to uh, the state of believers, the intermediate state. When believers die, we don't cease to exist. We have a spirit that goes back to God. The breath of God is not just mere oxygen. No, it's not just oxygen. Because when an individual dies, no matter how much oxygen that is pumped into their lungs, into their nostrils, that itself will not bring them back to life. When you read scripture over and over, if you notice when somebody uh, is dying, it would speak about they were departing, their soul was leaving, their spirit was leaving, and when they, when they came back to life, their spirit or soul returned. That is how scripture uh, describes the death experience. And so it's more than oxygen, the same word pneuma that is used to refer to our spirit is the same word used for God and the Holy Spirit. God is spirit. In John chapter 4 verse 24, pneuma esten hotheos. I'm not so sure if that's the exact Greek uh, construction, but I'm thinking in my head that's how it should be. God is spirit. It's the same word. So, so if it's just oxygen, then you're telling me God is just inanimate oxygen? We are told in Romans chapter 8 that the spirit of God, Numa 2 say you, the spirit of God testifies with our spirits that we are children of God. You mean to tell me that, that God's Holy Spirit is an inanimate oxygen that testifies with our inanimate oxygen that we belong to God? It makes absolutely no sense if we interpret uh, the Ruach Elohim in the Old Testament 
and, and the pneuma to say you the spirit of God in the New Testament to just be mere inanimate oxygen. It does not make any sense. God himself is spirit. The Holy Spirit is spirit. And they are always presented as being conscious beings. Uh, they have personality. They have will, uh, creative ability. It's the same thing with our spirits. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says, I worship God with my spirit, in my spirit. So our spirits are able to do things. So it's more than oxygen. Our oxygen can't worship God. We can't pray in our oxygen to God, but we can pray in our spirits. I mean, there, there is so much, uh, brothers and sisters, that, 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 I could, that I could extrapolate from what scripture presents. And so when believers die, our spirits depart this life and we go to be in the immediate personal presence of our maker. Our spirits literally live on. Yes, we are locked away from this earth. We are in a different realm. That's what Ecclesiastes talks about uh, uh, with respect to under the sun. But it does not mean that God can't allow us temporary access to actually come encourage believers to give dreams and visions, etc., to, to comfort the saints. It happens throughout Scripture. And we will we'll see that uh, in our next session. And so, brothers and sisters, death is not something that we should fear. When a believer dies, we go to a better place. Our spirits, our souls go to a better place. We go to be with Christ, with the saints in heaven. When we look at the resurrection, we're going to see that we are not going to be wiped clean. Our memories are not going to be wiped clean. We're not going to be flashed like men in black. No, we're not going to be uh, obliviated. That's not what's going to happen to us. Uh, uh, we will continue our conscious experiences and memories here on earth and relationships we'd have garnered. Those will continue. There is both continuity and discontinuity with respect to the resurrection. And we'll see that the same way that Jesus was resurrected in a glorified body. And he continued and the disciples recognized him. But now his body was no longer subject to matter. And he could do things with his body, just walk through walls, etc. We are going to experience the same thing. We look at that in the resurrection. But there is a part of us that lives on, beloved friends, that survives the death of the body. And the intermediate state for believers is a glorious, wonderful one. We are free from our stresses and, and labors. Uh, we are free from heartache and pain and these bad experiences of this life. We are free from worries. We are free from illnesses. Yes, we are free from even the good things too, like our wives, our sons and daughters and friends and good relationships. But heaven is much better. And we wait and anticipate and observe our family members here as we wait for their moment and the consummation of all things. This is what scripture has to say about the intermediate state. Jesus couldn't be more, 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 more clear on how he conceptualized uh, uh, the nature of man possessing a body and a spirit that survives the death of the body that never separates from himself and from God. Paul was inspired by the spirit of God. He could not be uh, more clear either. Peter, who was a close disciple of Christ, under one charge with uh, leadership and preaching the gospel, he couldn't be more clear either when he says when Christ died, his body remained here, yes, but his spirit went uh, uh, to Hades. He couldn't be more clear. Ephesians 4, we, 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 we spoke about it earlier. And if you, well, I, my time is gone. I'm not going to go to it and then spend too much time. But Ephesians 4 is even clearer still. From verses 4 to 12, where it says, when he, when he descended to the lowest parts of the earth, another conceptualization and terminology for Hades, uh, he, and, and he came up, he led captivity captive. That is, those who were held as Satan's captive. That's captive. He took them as his captives and he ascended up in heaven and he gave gifts to men to continue to build the church and to preach and to teach. It couldn't be more better, beloved friends. And Sister Sheree's grandma St. Peter also spoke of death as departure. Yes, 2 Peter chapter 1. He, he said, I, I need to encourage you, bring these things to your memory. Before my exodus, before I take my leave from this physical tent, before I lay off this tent as the Lord showed me, let me bring these things to your remembrance. You're absolutely right there, sister. And so, beloved friends, there are things that you need to fear. We go to a better place. 
uh, we're not heathens and pagans for believing in we have a spirit or soul that survives the death of the body that goes to be with Christ, that we are indeed in a better place in heaven. And we are somewhere around the throne of God, as the popular song says. That is what scripture says. And again, you're free to disagree. But again, if I'm misinterpreting these passages that we went through tonight, please, you know, provide your exegesis and let me examine it so that I can see if, it's, if, if it provides a better rendition than what I'm seeing what scripture says here. But other than that, beloved friends, uh, we, we can take comfort for now to know that the souls of the righteous are in a better place with God in heaven. Uh, we, we, we enjoy his personal presence at death. And the saints are encouraging us. They're happy to strengthen us and to be used by God every now and again to step into this realm to inspire and encourage and bring messages until Christ comes and he consumes everything and we are given resurrected bodies to live eternally. This is what scripture presents with respect to the state of believers in the intermediate state. And so God bless you. Thank you very much for joining me tonight and for your patience. Uh, so hopefully tomorrow when we... When we um, Get back together. We're going to look at the state of unbelievers and we're going to talk about soul sleep, psychopanarchism. We're going to look at that. We look at the rich man and Lazarus. I know some of you may have uh, thoughts and questions on that. We're going to look at that, beloved friends. Uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, Moses and Elijah and the significance of that. Uh, apparent to Jesus on, on, on the Mount of Transfiguration. And also thereafter, we look at some things as to why Psychopanarchism, soul sleep doesn't make much biblical sense as well. So thank you very much for, for joining me tonight, brothers and sisters. I'm happy that you enjoy this uh, study. I know no doubt that um, you would have learned something. You would have been challenged by some things. And I'm just happy that you could have been here. And of course, feel free to share these presentations with friends and family, whoever you think may um, be blessed and encouraged by them. Um, I will post it on YouTube as well. So even though it might not be, well, it'll be on my page. You'll have to search, but it'll be easy to find on YouTube. So you can watch it there as well or share the link with them so they can be blessed by it. So uh, let me just see if anyone has any questions or input very quickly before I sign off uh, here and let you go. Let me just accommodate a few questions or uh, thing that anyone may have. But I see so many of you join. God bless you all. And I'm happy that you all enjoy the study. I'm seeing so much good feedback. I'm really um, grateful to see that because the aim of, of uh, these presentations, of course, is to uh, strengthen and encourage you and to also challenge your mind uh, to investigate these things. And so I'm happy that these purposes are being met. Uh, Sister Aliandra, yes, hello, hello. <laughs> Sister Penda, how you doing, sis? Wonderful sister in the Lord. Brother Jonathan Mason, Dr. Dave Milton, nice to have you all. Sister June as well, Brother Chevron Montague, saying the Spirit slash the breath of God. No disagreement there. I think our disagreement is that you think it's just mere oxygen, whereas Scripture presents it to be much more than mere oxygen. It's a non-material or immaterial entity that is conscious, that is living, that is breathing, that is active. And so, yes, yeah, spirit slash breath of God is the same interchangeable terms, but I think is the characteristics you have of it that may be the problem. For you, it's just mere inanimate, lifeless oxygen. It is just, it, you know, just oxygen. But again, scripture doesn't present the spirit of God, nor the breath of God that we have as just mere oxygen, but a living, conscious, animate entity. So that is the difference there. Uh, yeah, let me see. So any more, any questions or input? Don't say our soul is our mind, will, emotions, personality. The spirit, Numa, is our connection with God where God lives in us. You're absolutely right, sister. You are absolutely uh, correct. That is how scripture presents it. And these aspects, by the way, are not part of our physical matter. You know, you can't cut me up and dice me up and use a microfine glass to actually find the real me. You, you can't cut up my brain and dice it up and find my mind. It's an immaterial aspect of, that works with my brain that allows me to have conscious existence on this planet. Will, emotions, personality is the same thing. Our spirits, you, you just can't scientifically prove these things. You, you can't measure and weigh them. 
there are immaterial aspects of us. So you are absolutely right, sister. Uh, Brother Carmela says, William said, good word, preacher. Thank you, bro. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Sister Sherry says, better than when Kamal Williams got home. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Immediate personal presence. Much better than the absence. Uh, Avo Adwater say awesome teaching. Brittany Naomi says amen, amen. God bless y'all. I'm happy y'all enjoyed it. Shout out to all of y'all. Sam Brown, my wife. Kamal, nice to have you, sweetie. Brother Joshua, all the way from India, says uh, praise the Lord. He's watching the live stream. Wonderful, bro. I'm glad you um uh, would have enjoyed it. Greetings to you, min uh, Minister uh, Lamar Hari. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to sign out. Sister Shri says, 1 Thessalonians 3.13 also mentions the saints who come with Jesus. Absolutely, they're with him and they're coming uh, back. He's coming back for their bodies. All right, so uh, those of you who join late, um, you will definitely have to watch the playback or watch it on YouTube when I post it there uh, so you can get the fulsome presentation. And so I'm actually closing doing the final um, touch-ups. So, so you'll, have, you'll actually have to do that to watch it properly. Sister Jones says, this is fire thunder. God bless you, sis. Thank you very much. I'm glad you think it's really um, uh, full of the Holy Ghost fire and sound biblical teaching. Sister Sheree says, I love how you teach about the original language. So powerful. Uh, thank you, sis. Thank you. Yes, uh, we are equipped to do that. It sheds a lot of light on, um, on scripture. And so when we're able to actually present it to give you all a uh, better background info, it actually does that because... <laughs> the truth about it is people will rave about, you know, as I said, the English comma, when in fact in the Greek is not there. You know, the original manuscripts, you don't have a comma. Uh, they, they weren't looking for commas in these punctuations and dictions. Uh, in the manuscripts, you have everything smashed together, literally. The words are in all caps and they're smashed together, right? There's no, no space and no commas, nothing. And the way you're going to make sense of it is by the, the words themselves, when you identify the articles, the prepositions, the nouns, the pronouns, and, and all of these various constructions and how they break, how they join, all of these, you know, syntax and grammatical uh, constructions, that's how you're going to figure out uh, how to separate them. But the mind scripts themselves don't have that. You know, they, it's not like English. And so when you're going to make a whole, send a whole theology around a comma and where it should be placed, I mean, you have completely missed is <laughs> the reality here you know you 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 need to go sit down somewhere have several seats with that comma argument because you you can't show me no comma in the original greek what you have to do is pass the words themselves and break down the syntax and grammar to make sense of what is being said so so that's why i had to do that because uh for people who believe in so sleep they, they their whole argument is hinged on the comma when in fact as i said the greek does not have a comma it's the word themselves in the construction that you have to decipher to get what is being communicated. Uh, Cordell Daniel says we are changed from model to a model. That's, that's, that's correct. Uh, we look at the resurrection in 1 Corinthians uh, 15 that talks about that indeed. Uh, okay, uh, Sister Kathy Anaya, nice to have you. I'm glad you thought the teaching was awesome. Uh, there's so many of you. Uh, Brother Eric Summers, I ain't heard from you in years. I'm well, I'm well. How you doing? All the way from Portland. Uh, if you're still there, nice to have you, bro. I'm doing well. Just um, still on the work of the Lord, you know. Uh, so I'm going to sign out now, uh, peoples. I love you all. Take good care. I'm happy you all could accommodate me in your homes to teach, uh, continue to teach on this issue. And God's willing, tomorrow we'll continue with uh, the state of unbelievers. We look at soul sleep and the other things, as I mentioned. And I'm sure you'll enjoy that as well. And then, of course, we'll transition into other things and the resurrection surrounding uh, uh, the biblical view of death. We may look at uh, uh, judgment as well. I'm not so sure. I may present uh, the various views, whether it's eternal conscious torment or annihilation completely. You go into oblivion. We may look at those as well. But we'll see how that goes. But thank you again for, for joining me. I'm happy you were blessed by the teaching. And please feel free to share them. Uh, share the teaching so that others can enjoy them and be blessed by them as well and be challenged too if necessary uh, by them so you all have a wonderful evening and I'll, I'll continue to interact on the post just in case you have any questions or anything you want me to clarify further i i'll, I'll be right here on the post to um do some clarification if necessary so have a good evening and y'all take good care